Driven brutally from their homes by the Japanese, the people literally came out of the ground. A few at first, then whole families, communities. They'd been living for weeks in caves and burrows. They were starving and sick, dazed and shocked from exposure and bombardment and fear. Fear of us, for they believed that their men would be murdered and their women turned over to our troops. That their children and their aged would be shipped to San Francisco to be ground up into dog meat. So they had been told by the Japanese army. And at first they had believed it. But somehow they heard of the fair treatment received by the first few who knew better or feared less. When they discovered that our civil affairs units were not designed for rape, torture or slaughter, so many gave themselves up that by D-Day plus three, we had over 6,000 in custody in the Marine Corps area alone. And six days later, 31,000. Military government had started to function with the finding of the first civilian. Its highly specialized personnel was first concerned with getting the Okinawans safely out of the Japanese perimeter and preventing them from confusing the fire in advance of our expanding beachhead. An entire population, equivalent to that of the state of Vermont, had to be rescued from the impact and shock of a battle that was never more than a few thousand yards away. At first, there was no way of knowing how many of these people were yet uncollected. It was known, however, that over 100,000 of the younger and healthier men had been evacuated to Japan just prior to our invasion. It was also known that most of the younger Okinawan women had been forced to accompany the Japanese garrison when it withdrew to the hills. This girl refused to go with them. They cut off her foot and left her alone to starve. The rest of the population had been ordered into the hills with 30 days rations and commanded to kill themselves rather than submit to capture by the Americans. But they preferred to live. So much so that in 25 days, our civil affairs sections had accumulated 150,000. The vanguard of what would eventually be the largest number of enemy civilians yet captured in the Pacific. Civil affairs encouraged the people to bring as much extra food and clothing as they could salvage. For while we were prepared to meet all cases of distress, their capture did not automatically make them American citizens as some believed. And we did not make the landing for the purpose of philanthropy. The Okinawans are of a mixed and mysterious racial origin. And although they are legally Japanese nationals, they displayed no surface hostility. Nevertheless, one woman was caught with hand grenades concealed under her dress, and some were found smuggling food to bypass Japanese soldiers. They may have been merely innocent bystanders of battle, as they claimed, but they were kept under constant observation and moved quickly from the zone of military installations. Central collection stations, interrogation facilities were established. Here intelligence personnel from civil affairs screened all adult Okinawans for military information. Means of identification was issued to ensure safe conduct within prescribed zones to those who were considered reliable. But civilian clothes might be a convenient disguise for Japanese soldiers assigned to espionage, sabotage, or assassination behind our lines. Civil affairs had to be watchful for military security is the primary purpose of military government. That and humanity is the basis of our beachhead law. For both these reasons, public health had to be safeguarded. Army and Navy doctors were quick to search out and isolate any contagious disease that might menace our troops with epidemic. For many, this was the first medical treatment they had ever received, for the Japanese had maintained only three doctors for every 10,000 Okinawans. In our country, the ratio is 40 per 10,000.
Thousands answered sick call daily for treatment of chronic diseases. But 80% of all immediate hospitalization was for wounds suffered on the fringe of combat. The Japanese had further complicated the health problem before they retreated by releasing a large colony of lepers to wander helplessly around the island. From the collection centers, the civil population was evacuated to villages where they would not hinder our military movement. Here at morning muster, all able-bodied men reported to the civil affairs officer in charge for daily instructions and assignments. They were organized into groups with leaders appointed from among themselves and under our supervision, they helped to govern themselves. They kept daily census, reported their sick, distributed their own food, and aided in the allotment of housing. Their headmen explained and helped enforce our proclamations, such as this one forbidding loitering near military installations. They were not being pampered, but in return for a little dignity, they relieved us of many of the minor problems of nursemaiding over 300,000 civilians. Invaluable aid was offered by a handful of professional people, teachers, doctors, and nurses, like these girls, some of whom had lived in Hawaii. They knew and respected Americans and voluntarily guided their people toward understanding and cooperation. Law is inseparable from order, and to maintain order, all government buildings were sealed by proclamation, impounding for examination all documents which might be of value to our intelligence section. In these buildings were village records and tax rolls which would aid in restoring confiscated property when military expediency would permit, so that no man could say he was denied justice by his new government. With a total population 15 times more dense than that of the United States, the food problem was acute. A strict system of rationing had to be established with a daily food allowance issued to heads of families from a community ration dump. A monetary system was not established while the fighting was still going on, but a record was kept of all rations issued for a future accounting. The food itself was diverted from captured Japanese army stores. And with the exception of special medical rations for infants, invalids, and the critically undernourished, the people could eat only what was on the island when we came so that no supplies were diverted from our troops for civilian use. They would have to get along on a diet of rice, tea, barley, and dried fish until their farms were clear of the combat zone and they could return to salvage their crops.